You know, the one big question, or we might say the one question in three parts, that has been asked since the beginning of time, is the one that nobody seems to have an answer for. The great question is, where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Now, to go on century after century without really giving much investigation to this subject seems remarkable. It was, we would think that it would be the first thing everyone would think of. But I suppose it's been the frustration of not having a good answer. But the fact remains that until we have some concept of our own purpose, it is very difficult to expect us to solve problems and make the proper progress in civilization. We are here for a reason of some kind. Most people are willing to admit the possibility of it. Others are not at all sure. Now, there are three schools of thought on the subject. The first is the materialistic. And this school is very simple. We are here for no reason. We are simply a continuing pattern of accidents. We will continue as long as we make mistakes, as long as our processes of perpetuation go on, and when that ends, we will end with it. We came from nowhere in particular. We are going nowhere after we pass out of here, and our little life is rounded by a sleep. Now, this is not very satisfactory. It has helped to establish one of the most difficult situations we face, and that is materialism as a way of life. If we're going nowhere, if we came from nowhere in particular, and are here for no reason in particular, then all ethics, morality, culture are illusions. We are simply something that it is going to be active and animated as long as we breathe. As soon as the death hits, we are finished. There's nothing more to be expected, nothing more to be hoped for. Well, many people in the, in the modern world have been following that belief. In fact, it is regarded as the intellectual, a superior attitude. It explains everything by denying everything and expects to build upon this foundation an enduring culture. This materialistic point of view is obviously a perfect reason for the trouble we're in. If there are no principles in life, if there are no realities, and each individual lives for himself and for what he can get, and we'll all will lie down and sleep forever, there is very little meaning to existence. There is no hope, no purpose no outlet into the future, no fulfillment of dreams or hopes or aspirations, simply this dogged continuance of birth, death, and decay. Well, for a long time, they, we considered this is to be rather an elegant attitude. But now, in the emergencies of life, we are not quite so certain. We're a little worried. If all the, there is is what is here, and all we can do is what we have done, and some more of the same. The future does not look very bright. Now, the second point of view is the theological. The theological point of view has been held in all parts of the world by various groups. But strangely enough, theolo theology is not consistent in all of its branches. All theologies do not have the same beliefs. But all of them do believe that the human being has a reason for existence. The uh, theology believes that man was created by a divine power, that he is here to fulfill a divine destiny, and that after he is finished here, he will depart to a place of punishment and re or reward according to the merits of his life. Well, this seems like another neat past package, and it has been followed and accepted. But again, it is rather difficult to explain it. Because while we now place everything in the hands of deity, 
deity doesn't seem in this sense, sense to have a reasonable purpose for all the work that has been done. The deity is not a very practical if it is creating things in its own image, treating them according to its own will, and returning them to itself regardless of what happens. This seems to mean that there's a great deal of waste energy, wasted time in the divine process. If all things are created by deity, they could have been created correctly in the first place, and that would have been the end of it. We would all be good, we would all be enlightened, and we would all be children of the eternal. This is not the way it is. And after having created us with the wisdom of a divine power, this divine power has left us to struggle as best we can against the troubles and worries and problems of mortal existence. So we have this pr next problem, is that man is a spiritual being, that the, uh, that the human being is a creation, is a type in itself, that it was fashioned for a purpose, and that this purpose rests in the mind of deity. That man has not yet fully understood the purpose is obvious. But theology affirms that there is a purpose and that while we may not be able to prove it scientifically, we can experience through the mystery of faith the importance of this purpose. After it is all said and done, we will depart according to our merits and our demerits. But it's again a little difficult to understand this because so many different kinds of merits and demerits present themselves for consideration. We find the poor and the suffering. We find individuals beyond the hope of, hope of life that is worthwhile. We find wars and pillage and all the difficulties and inhumanities of man to man. And we wonder how all this can exist within a world created by a benevolent deity. So again, there are questions. There are doubts. There are problems as to how many people are good enough to go to heaven and how many people are bad enough to go to hell. There seems to be a sort of middle distance where most folks mingle in a confusion of, vir of virtues and vices. All of this seems to indicate a very uh, inadequate explanation of the realities of existence. There should be something better than this. It is something that has been accepted on faith. Well, faith is a wonderful thing, and we all have to have it. But we'd like to see a certain reasonable demonstration of the verities of faith. We like to believe that behind and beyond all of our human uncertainties, there is a divine or universal plan of some kind suitable to meet the needs of all these creatures. Not only human, but all the other creatures of nature. For we are told in many religions that all creatures, great and small, are part of the great pilgrimage of life to matter, which we call evolution. The third approach to the matter is uh, the philosophical approach, and that is very largely in the keeping of uh, Oriental peoples, or was, although it was held in high esteem by the Greeks, and, and it also came into some play in the early Roman Empire. And that is the doctrine of reincarnation. <coughs> Reincarnation makes the life of the individual only a chapter in a larger existence. Well, this doesn't necessarily solve anything, but it gives a larger perspective. The individual is not just brand new each time he gets here, and he's not all worn out and ready to cease when he departs. And the various de developments and degrees of intelligence, the various unfoldments of virtues and vices, are according to laws and principles. Therefore, out of the doctrine of metempsychosis, as it was called by the Greeks, came the belief that each of our little embodiments is a chapter in a development of a great over-soul, a great power, as Emerson calls it, a power which is manifesting itself through a creation in which it embodies itself and goes on through ages of, an un of growth and unfoldment. The doctrine of reincarnation has certain attractions to it also. It becomes the basis of uh, hope, of uh, realities. It gives us the possibility of planning a little bit 
as to what we are going to do. It gives us the hope that we'll get some more of it done later. And it also will help us to realize that part of what we have now, we have earned at some past time. So we have this rather philosophical uh, attitude of being willing to live now because it's part of a greater life. And we have escaped the single life concept. We do not have the belief or feeling that in a few years all things must be solved. We rather assume that things will go on on and on through long periods of time. Now all of this enter also enters into another consideration. Here we have deity as a power. Whether we desire to consider it as a being, as a person, as a principle, as an energy, as a concept, as a, con a convic conviction, or as merely a belief. We have the idea of a sovereignty of virtuous intelligence. We place at the head of life a deity. Now, this is not necessarily easily provable, but there is enough evidence acc accumulating, as Bacon pointed out, to indicate that there is a sovereignty of intellect that guides all things. There is a power in nature that predisposes all natural things to come in the full fulfillment of themselves. Therefore, there is a predestination for salvation. There is something that we must expect. We must expect to have the opportunity to overcome our limitations and also to come into the direct participation in the glory and goodness of deity. So we have all these things and we believe them all. And we have all kinds of little beliefs, not quite so strong or powerful or sincere as or more complicated, but still beliefs that are held by Aboriginal peoples uh, and have were held long ago and have faded away, but were part of our heritage of believing. All these things together then constitute a situation. Now comes the more important part of this situation. Is it enough to affirm that such possibilities exist what do we do with the beliefs that we hold? If we have a certain belief, are we doing anything with it? Are we all doing exactly the same thing with different beliefs? Is the materialist and the theist, are they both doing the same kind of things in daily life, although their beliefs are entirely different? We must say to ourselves, is the atheist who believes in nothing uh, in any way superior to or inferior to a theist who believing much continues to act exactly as he did before. How we to find any end indication that the beliefs that we hold result in major changes in our living? Are we living toward a belief, from a belief, or alongside of one which we have never actually embraced? Here we have a belief, for example, in metempsychosis or reincarnation that we are here to experience and to learn and then we find millions of people doing everything they possibly can to, ex to escape experience and learning the one thing they want is to be left alone to do as they please well that is more or less a frustration of a law if they believe there is a law there are realities there are rules and then pay no attention to them nothing much has been accomplished. Even the most beautiful law of all beliefs uh, dies of warning if nobody accepts it. So we have individuals now who believe they will live again but are not building anything to use if they should live again. They quite certain they will be back but what will they be like when they come back? What were they like when they came here this time? And why do they come with a mass of unfinished business and after a certain number of years depart with most of that business still unfinished. Therefore we have an inconsistency. We have a belief in integrities but they do not impel the individual who claims to believe in these integrities to live according to them. There are many, many different schools of thought on reincarnation, for example, of different types of believing in connection with it with the reasons that cause it, the reasons that manifest through it, 
the purposes for which it is intended. But the majority of persons who claim to believe it today are not practicing any of those virtues any better than the individual who has no such belief. Now the same is true of all the others. Those who believe in heaven according to the good book and are waiting for the advent of the Messiah are not living today as though they believed in anything. They want to go on exactly as they are, going now. They want to continue their investments, their box, stocks and bonds. They wish to have their private quarrels and their private uh, difficulties just the way they have always had them. So the fact that they believe in a better hereafter does not in many cases, at least, induce them to live to merit a better hereafter. You can go to church every Sunday for the rest of your life, but if you don't live any of it, in daily living, it is not certain that your attendance to the church is sufficient to guarantee salvation. It has something to do with conduct, something to do with ethics, something to do with morality. And these things today are not generally practiced, even by those who claim to believe things. So we have the individuals who have theological hopes, but they will sometime rest in the arms of the Lord, but they continue to foreclose mortgages just as they did before. In fact, in many instances, particularly recently, there's been a great deal of exploitation of religion. There have been many cases in which the gullibility has been injured, or the, the hopefulness of the people has been double-crossed by these exploitations of religious beliefs. So there is no definite certainty that, the, that these beliefs are producing what they claim to produce. There is also an indication that we have to consider that while the good book tells us that the good man has no place to lay his head, most of our modern religionists have found some place to rest comfortably. They are not inclined to suffer too much for their causes. So all these things come together and we have an interesting problem. We have all kinds of statements made and uh, I have them come to me frequently. Someone will say, well, uh, I, I, I want to get a better religion. I want to believe in something that's really going to do things. So you try to help them to find something, and you find it's rather difficult to get, get, find anything which you can heartily recommend as actually doing something that is necessary. So you can only suggest that one or two have seemed to have a little better reputation than the others. But all of it around sums up again to this question. Why are we here? Where did we come from? And where are we going? We have every theory you can imagine about it. But we have very little solid, substantial footing upon which to build personal character. So this brings us back again to what constitutes, to my way of thinking at least, a very important uh, phase of learning, and that is ethics. Ethics are very important. Ethics are the practice of integrities. An ethical life is a life which contains within it a maximum of ethics or a maximum of constructive ex explanation and experience. The ethical aspect of life then will say that is why we should uh, be good. is because that's ethics. And if we're good and it's ethics, that's going to be a big help to us. But is it? Uh, we mostly find that ethical people, really ethical people, are poor and downtrodden. Most of the ethical individuals are not actually benefiting from ethics, nor do they know where they're going. The ethical life doesn't mean that you're going to have immortality. It is not, in any sense of the word, a solution to materialism. It doesn't necessarily represent materialism. The individual, ethically, could be mortal and disappear into the earth with his ancestors, and still he would have died a good man, for in some other belief he might have died a bad man. But these things do not seem to solve anything. So we come in the end to the great problem that has faced us from the beginning of time. What kind of a world do we live in? Now we would think it would be quite easy and pleasant uh, to depend now upon science which has done so much 
to expand our understanding of worlds and world conditions. Science, therefore, might well describe the kind of universe or the kind of nature that is permeating all experience or is justifying all the worlds in which we function in our daily living. But now science also has its limitations. Science, for some unknown reason, has never quite been able to get its way into a true using universal ethic. Science is exact as far as it goes, but most of its exactness has to be revised occasionally. There is no true, complete system of approved and immovable ethics in science. And without ethics, science is dangerous. And with uh, ethics, it could be very constructive. But science is not aware of a pattern which it can scientifically demonstrate to be ethical. Ethics does not seem to arise in nature. But I think the scientist has overlooked something. He's overlooked the fact that he can't find any ethics in nature because nature itself is one ethics in itself. Nature is the supreme example of ethics and uh, continues this way. But with us mortals, we are constantly trying to destroy the ethics of nature. We are trying to prove that the illusions of science are more real and valuable than the realities of nature. So we go to the rules that we have ourselves invented and neglect the rules which were invented long before we existed. So the problem comes back again to the problem of the administration of the universe. Is there a God? Some say yes, some say no. Some say it's a principle. Some say it's a person. Some say it's a structure of laws. It's an infinite mind, an infinite will, an infinite purpose. It is ultimate reality. All these words and terms are important to us, but we do not always know what they mean. So we have now come to another problem. How to explain ourselves to ourselves or to each other in a manner that can help to move us into a new dimension of life in the century ahead. We have all these questions. We have all kinds of good ideas. We have all kinds of ethical ideals and idealistic think thinking, but nothing seems to happen. The good is always, in a sense, in the abstract. The discomforts are all in the concrete. We are daily suffering in a world in which we are constantly creating p patterns of beauty, magnificence, and divine order. So we have now to kind of look it all over and see what we're working with. What is man? What is man that thou shalt be mindful of him? What is it that's trying to grow here? Is the individual an eternal being moving through a non-eternal atmosphere or environment? Is the individual a spark of the divine? Is humanity collectively the nature of a divine being? Is the human being a creation of divinity? Or is it a result of the unfoldment of natural laws in the material world? The question of man's place becomes terribly important in determining his future. So we can look around and we can say to ourselves, let's see what is happening. Here we have a comp competition. We have two forces pulling against each other for control of human destiny. On the one hand is the invisible force of life itself, the divine pattern, whatever it may be. This stays remain, and remains unchangeable. On the other hand, we have man creating a private universe of his own. The, the scientist, the, the mystic, the theologian, the ethical thinker, all are working together to create a universe of their own. The universe which has its roots in realities which they postulate. So that we have now on one side a materialistic creation of one group and on the other side an idealistic creation by another group. And the uh, answer, of course, is rather obvious. Which is the most comforting? 
The answer, of course, is the idealistic is the most comforting. But what is the most difficult to obtain? The idealistic. Therefore, many people are willing to settle for material comforts, material success, and uh, material benefits in order to create the little pattern of their living. So here a little child comes into the world. This child that comes in, did this child begin within the body of a parent? Or was there a spark of eternal life that took form and grew and was finally born among us? Where is the, where did man come from? Where did humanity begin? Where is that spark from which animates everything that comes into the world? Is this spark part of an eternal flame? Or is this part merely, is this part merely a fragment of a spark that has gone on from generation to generation in the perpetuation of species? What is the beginning of all this? It's very hard to answer some of those questions. But the more we think about it, the more we are forced to realize that most of the answers we have created are not adequate. The answers that we have come from our ignorance rather than from our wisdom. And yet we have to do something. We can't live forever in a mystery. So we try to clear that mystery by our own mentation. We try to think our way out of this mysterious uh, situation which we have created for ourselves. I think then that the problem comes very closely to all of us. That we are forced to decide one of two or three things. We can say that each of us is born as a completely separate being, that we never existed before and we will never exist afterwards. We live a little time in the light and darkness of material existence and then fade back into the darkness from which we came. And in the meantime, while we're in this world, we have progeny that goes on after us. And in turn, this progeny has progeny and each generation dies, and things go on forever through a principle of generation. This is one answer to it. But it's not very comforting, and it's not very meaningful. If there is a deity, if there is a power behind things, why should this power create a situation that goes on indefinitely without improvement, or goes on forever without fulfillment, or continues to present conflict if there is a deity in behind and in everything, how can there be continual conflict? Is God in fact conflict with himself? Is God in conflict with his own creation? Is there any other creation but his? The devil was introduced at this point as a convenience, but he's lost face entirely. <laughs> he is practically ceased to exist as a fact in our thinking. So we come down to very interesting things. Here we are, each of us, trying to live a decent life. We are doing what we can. We are hoping for the best. We are tired of war. We are tired of exploitation. We are tired of corruption. And we want to know where it came from. And we also want to know what to do about it. Now, if we are accidents in space and we're just there, then there's nothing much we can do about it. We just have to go along with the unfoldment of generations until either the, we wake up to something new or else we go to sleep forever. But there is no way in which we can solve the problem on the basis of the thinking that we are doing at the present time. So we go now to the problem of a better way of life. We are worrying constantly about the future. We are concerned over the 21st century that is about to come. We do not know where we are going, nor why. We do not know where we came from or what happened to us. But we are here, isolated, cast away like, like a sailor on a desert island. We are here. And every time we try to do something, it is conflicted. Every time we try to create something better, say that someone opposes it. And when we seek for peace, war breaks out. When we ask for virtue, crime is rampant in the land. All of these things constitute conflicts that the average person does not know how to solve. But if we add them all up, there's only one way of explaining them. If there is an intelligence, if there is a constructive power, if there is a God, then all these things that happen have a purpose. They mean something. 
whether we understand it or not. But if they are purposed, and if they can be understood, then they should be understood. Because we are in desperate need of a, tra of a practical, working explanation of the problems of our own existence. We know that it, and it has to be change. If there is not change, we are all destined to some kind of a strange annihilation. And we also realize that we cannot believe in God and come to the conclusion that an all-powerful power can lead us into temptation and destroy us. Whatever is in there that is of deity must be good and must be of salvation, not of corruption. <clears throat> so little by little we argue our way in and out of the problems of our own existence. So now we come to a little better understanding. We now want to think better of what to do and how to do it. And we want to pick out of the world around us those laws and principles which will most certainly contribute to a better way of life for all of us. And of course, one of the problems we immediately arise, immediately arises in connection with it, is that materialism is an inadequate because it is concerned only with something that is itself inadequate. Material existence is mostly a pain, a suffering cast upon the human race. Materialism solves nothing, attains nothing, and justifies nothing. It is simply based upon the concept that while we're here, we should get everything we can because when we die, we'll never live again. Therefore, to be uh, completely objective, uh, to strive for the immediate fulfillment of things is the materialistic answer. And we find it today in the uh, narcotics, in alcoholism, and all these things, that the moment of joy, the great moment of fulfillment through corruption ends in the destruction of all concerned. So that is not the answer. Then we look to the various faiths of the world to find if we can find among them an answer. We do find one thing in the faith that is important, and that is that faith has to be in faith in something. Faith has to be an endorsement of some value, of some recognition. And the theist can definitely discover a very reasonable cause for faith, or a reasonable explanation for it. Faith becomes a constructive believing. It is the acceptance of the benevolence of a parent, invisible but ever-present. It is also based upon the simple statement that this vast structure must have a purpose. The moment we conceive that it has a purpose, it also becomes obvious that it has not fulfilled that purpose. That it could fulfill it is also a potential. We are therefore concerned with the, in religion with the faith in the reality of powers that will serve, will save, and will perfect the creation of which we are a part. Therefore, we take great hope in theology in the sense that it becomes an answer. It makes the power at the root of things benevolent. It makes it also a conscious power. And it also makes the supreme master of all works a moral and ethical creature. God becomes an integrity. God becomes something that cannot be corrupted by the corruptions of mankind. So faith does give us a faith in the substance of a better condition than we have ever known. And we see it around us and we see evidence of it. We see the effects of faith upon the private life of people. So we can compare the effects of unbelief and belief in the workings of civilization. We see the materialist, we see no good come out of it. We see that the best that the materialist can give us is certain materialistic satisfactions which are themselves passing. And either they pass or we do. So there is not fulfillment of anything. But in the case of faith, we have an inspiration to explore the unknown and to discover it to be essentially good. Faith, therefore, gives us a belief in the final integrity of life and that we can all, to one way or another, can unfold and become part of this integrity. 
But also faith is a little bit disciplinarian. Faith in any belief, as in religion or ethics, is, is a, an operating force. Therefore, an individual who has a faith must live it. If he believes certain principles, he must apply them. A faith that is in the mind but violated in conduct is of no value. So we have lost most of our essentials of faith as we've known them simply because they have been corrupted by ulterior motives. But corrupted or uncorrupted, it remains. The faith in a power greater than ourselves is one of the foundations of survival. It's the foundations of going on to something. Now, if you have faith that there is something to be done, that there is a future to be achieved, there is a growth that can be accomplished, and that in the universe there is a divine benevolence that is guiding all things into harmony with themselves and with their cause. Under those conditions, we then have to consider the application of faith. A belief held and not applied is really a hypocrisy. It is necessary for the individual who has faith in God, faith in truth, and faith in human beings to live according to that concept. He must gradually overcome the doubts, fears, and uncertainties of his own mind. And he, fortunately, nature has provided him with the means to do this. Some people consider it mere imagination, but a very short survey of facts in nature proves conclusively that there is an integrity in every step of natural procedure, that everything in nature is in harmony and in ethics, and the great destroyer is the human being. Man up to the present time is the great destroyer of nature as far as he is able to understand nature. He is constantly using his own skills to destroy the potentials of survival. So we have today the problem of environment and what we have to do about it. We have the problem of, of essential materials for survival, food. We have all kinds of problems of war and peace, all kinds of problems of crime and error and of ignorance and wisdom and vast problems in the field of education. All these things, therefore, tell us that if we believe, then we have to do something about it. And that is where we have fallen down. If we have considered materialism as merely an affectation, we are also inclined to view uh, idealism as an affectation. We keep right on saying, I'm an idealist, but we foreclose the mortgage on the innocent and the poor just the same. We say we are definitely dedicated to uh, principles of, of good citizenship, but we buy on the black market and we use all kinds of subterfuges to corrupt the business systems that we ourselves have created. So in the ethical system, we have another problem, the problem of not being able to live up to it. And so as we are talking about a divine world, then we are taking this divine world and corrupting it by our human selfishness. So we go to the final and end of the whole thing, beyond all of this. We go finally to the nature of the creating power itself. And I think that the Greeks and some of the Oriental peoples have given us our best interpretation of the nature of this power. That, uh, that actually the deity is infinite life in infinite manifestation. That everywhere in the world there is evidence of one tremendous creative power. This creative power is not a person. It is, we do not know really what it is, but it is an infinite. And it might very well be a strange body-like thing, like ourselves. The body we deal in is not a person. The person that dwells in the body is not really a person. We are dealing with principles, forms of life that are beyond our estimation, and yet are constantly active. And the real sources of all the things we want to know are in a grass mass of causal circumstances. And this was found in the mystics of the Middle Ages in Europe. The mystics discovered the universe of infinite benevolent causes. Bene, law, many others of this group 
found the inward experience that beyond and behind all physical things is infinite love and infinite manifestation that there is always and forever a tremendous divine outpouring and that this outpouring in some way is our hope is our fulfillment and that there is a promise in this fulfillment and in this hope that we will not be deceived so we come now to the times when we're going to look forward to another century we're coming into this century having broken practically every rule in nature we have done everything possible to be wicked and about all we have accomplished is to be nasty we are not able to be wicked we don't know how really all that we know is that we are selfish and we want to do the things we want to do we want wealth we want honor we want all the luxuries of existence we would like to have them at the same time with a good strong con con uh, positive conscience but it can't be done but we have now uh, come to a new realization of things and I think it comes down to the only answer that ever has been and that ever will be that each individual must take on the sal his own salvation the moment we trust to anybody else we are in difficulty the only power that we can trust in is the ineffable eternal which we can only glimpse perhaps remotely in moments of meditation or prayer but we cannot depend upon the various peoples of the world to give us the support and security that we have to have in the next few years then we must transform our daily believing into something stronger something more vital to us most people if asked what they believe will say they believe in peace but they have war something has to happen so that the believer in peace becomes strong enough and vital enough to create the fact of peace in his own life we cannot necessarily convert the world but each individual who believes in ethics and integrity everyone who is philosophically and mystically minded has to go to work on themselves they have to do everything possible to make sure that they are fulfilling their own integrities now if for instance an individual says I, I believe in brotherhood but he's having a terrible time with his neighbors this is a point to be considered the consideration is that the individual who believes in peace or believes in brotherhood has to practice it himself we would like to have governments pass great rules that there would be no more wars but those rules will never be passed the only end of war is when the human being demands peace the only time we can end all these confusions is when we decide to put integrity above every other consideration we cannot compromise we cannot serve God with one hand and the devil with the other so to speak we cannot be idealistic uh, on Sundays and materialistic the rest of the time <clears throat> now looking around today in the development of various religious beliefs we find something that I think we should bear very carefully in mind <clears throat> that we by finding new ways of expressing our integrities there are new beliefs coming along some of them are pretty bad some of them are pretty, pretty good but all of them have some bearing upon the recognition of the need for change we've got to move from theory to practice we've got to stop talking about brotherhood and start practicing it we have to gain gradually the strength to dominate the mistakes which we are inclined to make now to do that we have to have some kind of strength uh, we cannot be strong internally if our philosophy of life is based on an incomplete pattern of believing we cannot have the strength inside if we do not have certain values inside we have to recognize as superior to all considerations the infinite purpose that is locked within ourselves somewhere in this little body of ours is a spark of infinity this spark has always been there and it always will be there and it is representing constantly an infinite need that is awaiting fulfillment 
a generation after generation, embodiment after embodiment, we allow this germ to remain undeveloped. We have within ourselves this pr principle that says, love your neighbor. But when the time comes to practice it, we say, love ourselves. To heck with the neighbor. We have to recognize that the answer to our ethics is the fact that there is an ethic in ourselves. All of the virtues we seek around us are in us. The only reason we believe in them is because we are them. We couldn't believe at all. And yet with believing, we still do not fulfill the action necessary to transform a belief into a living fact. In order to transform our believings into facts, we have to practice them. And uh, uh, we have all kinds of problems of this nature. Now our ancestors working with this problem found out that there were certain people who apparently were particularly endowed with the probabilities of growth immediately. There was something, there was something in them that saw the need and was so vitalized by that seeing that they had to transform their life to the fulfillment of it. So we have constantly around us this recognition that these changes must come in order to survive. We know we cannot go on as this goes. We know that we are going to exhaust all the resources that we have. But we also know that there was no intention on the part of the creating power to leave us as a derelict, a dead planet floating in space. We were not supposed to cease. We were not supposed to die. We were not supposed to live in constant conflict until we destroy the world and ourselves. The thing that has come about is that there has been a gradual increase of selfishness, a gradual increase of the corruption of values. Now the divine principle, the ethics of things, will always stand with value. At the moment we break the rules, we break the contact with reality. The moment we break the laws of life, we destroy our own lives. Therefore, that we must get these things back through conscious effort. Now, in conscious effort, I think there's one interesting point. We have plenty of churches. We have a great many people and various groups that are sincerely interested in making a better world. But for the most part, these people are simply members of something. They go and assemble and discuss matters. They have conferences. They have meetings and clubs, delegation, which are sent here and there and elsewhere. But all of it, in a sense, has to do only with a kind of talking. It has, a meeting, again, a statement of what is necessary, but not a doing of what is necessary. We have got to begin to take hold of ourselves and look ourselves over something like this. Well, someone can say, well, I, I think I want to be more peaceful. I want to have uh, understanding. I want to have, uh, as my years advance, I want to have a gentle life. I want to have a friendly life and a kindly one. Well, that's fine. But between that kindly knife and our present state, there are a few problems to solve. We have, for instance, a relative we haven't spoken to in 40, 40 years. And one I told, told me one day, if they ever speak to me, I'll drop dead. <laughs> now, this person, with this attitude, has become an active member of a religion. But they still hate the relative, just as they did before. In other words, it does not change the attitude because they change the name of the affiliation. Another individual uh, is very much against everything because they've had two or three bad marriages and they'll never get over the loss of the, of the money that they wasted or the time and health that was expended in these conflicts. Therefore, they want peace. They want to live in harmony. They want to nourish the good life. But they also want to remember to the bitter end that they were deceived and, and deluded by material circumstances. Another person still has all their life uh, been a bit of a gourmand. They've eaten things they shouldn't eat, all that type of thing. 
So around 50 they get chronic dyspepsia. And when they get chronic dyspepsia, well, of course, one of the first things they do will be to join a religious organization. Because that's very good for dyspepsia. But the trouble is, after they join it, they do nothing to change themselves and the dyspepsia stays. So we find an, a member of an organization uh, demanding or hoping for good health who joins the organization and remains sick. The, or maybe get a placebo for a few months or so, takes on the emotional stress of joining, but after a while gets right back where they were. Everything that has to do with growth, as the Greeks pointed out, and also most of the Oriental peoples, and even the Near Eastern peoples, the beginning of a reformation of living is an acceptance of discipline. The individual must prove his own integrity or he cannot go on in the development of his spiritual resources. Now, it doesn't mean he may not try, but there is an automatic function that the individual who does not improve his own nature will not receive instruction reserved for those who do improve their natures. All the paths that lead to wisdom, true wisdom, are through purification, through dedication, and through the gradual restoration of integrities. The individual who wants to be wiser has got to live better. And they've got to live better before they become wiser. They cannot assume that when they fill out a blank or something of that nature, that they are ready for advanced instruction in something when they have never corrected one of their own shortcomings. His constant need for growth calls for a constant increase in discipline. Now, as the Greeks pointed out very successfully, when you, this, when you grow, the instruction comes. The problem of finding the teacher is not very serious because the finding of a teacher means that the development within the person makes it possible for them to recognize a condition superior to that which they was poor held. So that in Greece, those who really wanted to get wise, true, true wisdom, went through periods of discipleship and novitiates. The Pythagorean school required five years before it accepted a pupil for the development of higher things before they went into meditation, before they went into esoteric doctrines, before they studied rounds and races and all this uh, type of thing, they had to do the discipline of purification, regeneration, and in a sense, uh, relaxation. They had to clear their own mind of its fables and foibles before it was available for the study of realities. Therefore, the individual who joins up already burdened by every problem they can think of, joins some religious group in the hope of it curing them, should stop and remember that that is not the way nature does it. If they cure themselves, then the religious group can help them to grow. But as each individual must correct his own faults, and no doctrine is a panacea for the failure of the person to discipline his own nature. So we now have this problem of going on forever, which we suggest in the title of our lecture this morning. Here we are, wondering what that goes on. How far do we go? Who knows? Who knows what lies beyond any point that astronomy or physics or even higher mathematics could ever point it out? We are in the presence of an infinite life in infinite manifestation. We are in the presence of eternal realities unfolding through us and becoming clear as we become clear and becoming confused as we become confused. But all through this entire process there is an infinite going. We do not know what is next for man. When humanity make, makes the adjustment to this present problem and it outgrows itself, what's going to happen to it? There have been various oriental beliefs and so forth concerning what is going to happen to it. The, the entire internal structure of the human being will change as their ethics and their integrities change. 
in Raja Yoga for example the two great systems of uh, the nervous gangliated centers of the sympathetic uh, glandular structure and the central nervous system these two that are like the caduceus of Hermes two serpents wound around the spinal cord as man unfolds these two are going to become one and the two nervous systems will unite and in so doing will ever end the conflict between the cerebrospinal and the autonomic nervous systems this means an entirely different humanity different in appearance because appearance must take on the needs of the powers within the body differences of opinion but always a greater growth by means of which new revelations of internal power are represented also with each of these discoveries there comes another sensitivity today through the abuse of psychic faculties we can get into serious trouble as these faculties become more and more developed as the esoteric side of our own consciousness is released we are more sensitive than we ever have been now or could be now and the Lord would be, might cause us a headache now if we knew more and were more informed and we made a, a mistake uh, particularly in intentionally we tried to corrupt or misuse power we would find a tragedy far greater than would face us today because we know more and the more we know the more is expected of us the more we grow the more growth becomes natural to us and the time will probably come when the human being will become very much more complete than anything we see today the human being will be able to perpetuate itself it will have its own ways of life and death it will have its own bodies and patterns which may not even resemble what we have now but always it will be a growth towards reality and reality is always one thing a kind of perfect harmony in which the individual's life is in perfect harmony with the divine life stream until we are in harmony with the stream of life we will suffer but when we become able to join in with growth as a principle growing in as it, in integrities of these plans we will find that we have come a long way on our journey so somewhere in the long way forgotten past behind all that we have ever thought of and ever known were aeons beyond the stars sparks flying floating in infinite space gradually embodied creating great waves of life great orders of creation great kingdoms of nature gradually going on and on but always for a purpose the purpose being that through the experiencing of all things we become capable of disciplining ourselves and through the experience of this discipline we are able to be patient with those who are yet too weak and we will also have the discipline and the courage to protect the values which we have discovered the whole world of religion and the world of ethics is, of ma is man learning to respect that which is best and having learned to respect it learns to practice it and all this is part of the growth we don't know where it's going to end we hear people and the, the gods are referred to as ever living eternal powers in space far beyond anything we call galaxies or black holes the great universe of visible phenomena gradually fades away little by little the worlds become shadows and a new world reveals itself a higher step in the great laws and practices of creation and in this higher step we go forward forward to what? we go forward to a destiny for which we were intended for it is nothing which it must be remembered that in a sense we are all gods in the making and when we become gods in reality we will be the most humble of all creatures we will not be proud that we rule we will be sad that we cannot rule better little by little life is coming to every atom of space every tiny molecule must grow up every grain of sand must become a star and we are part of the carpentry we are part of the working crew that brings this about we are already transmuting all kinds of forces 
within our own bodies. Our own alchemy is at work. Our own Kabbalah is estimating and studying our proportions. Our understanding of astronomy is broadening out to recognize the universe of values rather than of the universe of forms. Everywhere we are growing, and growth begins with sincerity. And sincerity begins with the realization that as long as there are mistakes in our own thinking, we are going to suffer at least a little. But if we correct these mistakes, we will then become disciplined servants of the largest and most noble of all causes, the regeneration of universal life and the fulfillment of an infinite plan that is beyond our comprehension.